So this is the Navy Memorial here. Um, we've got four different fountains uh, representing four of the different oceans. The memorial itself, there's one statue over there uh, that's called the Lone Sailor. Uh, represents anyone who has ever served, is serving or will serve in the United States Navy. I can tell you guys a little bit about the Canadian Embassy, um, if you want. It was um, opened in 1988. It's a, a very fancy building, a very expensive building. Um, we've got 12 columns around here, around the whisper room, which is the echo chamber that we'll go up to in a minute. And if you make loud noises, stress you can, buster, you can hear it echo. Echo! <laughs> Woo! Throughout the chamber. <laughs> So this is the United States Capitol building. Some people think it's the White House, uh, they're wrong. So originally it was a much smaller building. When you can see the lighter color marble here represents the, the original building. The statue on top uh, is, is called Freedom. It's facing east uh, as it goes, people say, uh, so the sun will never set on the face of freedom. So obviously I know who this guy is. Father of our nation, George Washington. Tell me something about George we, we don't know. We know he's the father of our nation. He was the only president unanimously elected by the Electoral College. I bet you did know when he, after he was elected, he only had one tooth left. I did not know that. Yep. He refused to wear dentures. He actually wore false teeth, false teeth that were made out of hippopotamus, human, and elk teeth. You're kidding. No. <laughs> Henry, these are so lifelike. The, the size is accurate. The, the attributes are accurate. How are they made? Well, evidently there were no cities because all of them are deceased. So use watercolors, watercolors and sketches to make their figures. There were no videos, any, anything. How long does it take to make one of these? About six months. So I, I saw the special on HBO on John Adams. He was a feisty guy. Yeah. What else can you tell us about him? Well, he's the first president to live in the White House. I bet you didn't know that. I did not know that. There's something else about these two. They both died on the exact same day. Same, same day. Sounds like a conspiracy to me, but I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> What are the odds of that? Ah, one of my favorite presidents. Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Here we go. Abraham Lincoln, first president to be assassinated while in office. Now let's learn a few fun facts about some of the other presidents. Like, did you know President Reagan began his career as a radio sports announcer in Davenport, Iowa? President Ford received offers to play for the Green Bay Packers and the Detroit Lions. President Eisenhower was the first president to have his inauguration broadcast on television. My fellow Americans, I want to thank Henry again for a wonderful tour. Now it's time to party with some celebrities. We're one of the only museums, I would venture to say the only museum in the world who changes an exhibit daily. These are our front pages, they are daily front pages. What are the highlights that we should definitely check out? Well, you're going to definitely want to check out the Pulitzer Prize photography exhibit. The gallery there features photographs from all the Pulitzer winners, as well as some of the cameras used by the photographers, and it's a great place where you can really dig in and learn about not just see the photo itself, which is amazing and resonant enough obviously having won a Pulitzer but you can dig in and get the story behind the photograph get the journalists the photojournalists view and understand what was going on how they were experiencing things what else should we see so you want to see the Berlin Wall we have um, eight pieces of the original Berlin Wall here on exhibit in Washington. The International Spy Museum has the largest collection of spy artifacts of any museum in the world and it just so happens we have an actual former spy taking us on tour today. Well I went into that world at the height of the Cold War. The, war, the Cold War was getting underway. This is the 50s we're talking about, late 50s. A lot of the stuff you actually used. We're right here in disguise. I've used disguise. Uh, we're here near uh, uh, bugging equipment and so forth. I've used that sort of thing, not necessarily everything here, but certainly the, the, the elements of espionage that are depicted here I've been involved in, yes. So we think of spies, I mean everybody's intrigued with the life of a spy. You have James Bond. Okay. You think of it as the Bond experience. All right. How much of it is like Bond? My easy answer is all of it, but of course well, that's not quite true, is it? Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
I like this one because I used to watch Get Smart growing up, and I loved <laughs> Maxwell Smart. He had a phone. Yeah, that was actually a very early cell phone, wasn't it? Obviously, this is out of service. This isn't one of the newer technologies. How long does an artifact have to be out of service before it can come to the museum? Obviously, we don't want to see all the latest, greatest stuff here. We use our own judgment in what we're putting out here. Everything you're seeing in here, you know, has been described in the literature and the photographs. So Peter, I love this one particularly because you actually wore a jacket. That's like true. This. What was that like? Okay. This is called the buttonhole camera, okay? Because the lens is in the buttonhole. In other words, if we could if we could open and close the lens, you would see it like a little eye down there. So this exhibit is really for the birds. Uh, that's one way of putting it. But <laughs> this is one of my favorite exhibits. What well, these guys got a camera hanging off of them. And what that camera has is an automatic shutter release. So when the pigeon flies, the shutter release starts taking pictures. <laughs> so what did he do with this thing? Well, this is his 16-sided treading barn. So it was a very revolutionary concept for the time. He recognized that he was growing wheat and he needed a way to separate the wheat from the chaff um, in an efficient way. He also had horses that needed exercise. So they determined that if you ran the horses along the barn, you could make their, their hooves would knock the wheat off the chaff. So these are the slaves' quarters. These are the slaves' quarters for the household slaves. So the ones that were working in the kitchen, in the house, um, assisting the family. Um, others were living closer to the fields. In all, there were about 400 slaves that lived here during Washington's time. Now, when he died, he did include in his will the freeing of his slaves. However, several of the slaves that were living here on the property were Mrs. Washington's slaves and came down through her family. This is so romantic. Yes, it is indeed. Final resting place of George and Martha Washington side by side. He's right here on the right and she's there on the left. She had lived in by three years. Now a lot right. of his family members are buried on property here. There are 30 people buried uh, from the Washington family that are buried here in all, yes. It is so peaceful out here. There's so much land, mm -hmm. yet we're so close to D.C. How it's do you incredible. get here from D.C.? It's actually quite easy to get here. We're 16 miles down the George Washington Memorial Parkway, so from the Lincoln Memorial to Mount Vernon, it's about 16 miles. You can do what you did and arrive by boat, which is a wonderful way and certainly a way that many of Washington's guests would have. I would choose the Spirit of Mount Vernon anytime. It's a great way to go. You, you sit back, relax, enjoy the water, enjoy the beautiful Potomac, great scenery, have a nice tour, head back, back to Washington, D.C.